welcome to week two of supersymmetry and conformal field theory. So this week we're going to talk in more detail about what this Coleman-Mandula theorem uh, really is saying. Uh, we don't have space to prove it, unfortunately. It, it, the, the details of the proof use techniques that are not really germane to the, the rest of our discussion in this class. And so it, I think it makes sense. If you're interested in that, you can go read it on your own. But, but in interest of time and space, what I really want to do is have you understand what, what, the, what the statement of the theorem means. Okay, so that's going to be the goal of, of this week, uh, to, to see what coleman mandula is saying and also what it's not saying. Uh, that, that it's saying that you can extend the Poincaré group in a very limited set of circumstances and that those circumstances include either supersymmetry or conformal, uh, conformal symmetry. Okay, so let's get started. coleman mandula so let me begin by giving you a plan uh, for the next three mini lectures. So my plan to be able to explain what the coleman mandula theorem says, I first want to tell you in more detail or remind you in more detail uh, about the Poincaré group, about internal symmetry groups. And then with those two things in hand, I, I, I can give you a precise statement of the theorem. And these three, three objects together, uh, that's our first mini lecture, okay? And then the next two mini lectures, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the loopholes. So lecture two, we'll talk about how supersymmetry is a loophole. And lecture three, we'll discuss how conformal symmetry is a loophole. Now, supersymmetry and conformal symmetry, I'm assuming these are gonna be new concepts for you. Uh, to give you a precise definition of what supersymmetry is, that unfortunately is gonna to have to wait uh, for the second half of, of the module when we get to the nitty gritty of, of, of supersymmetry and, and the me mechanics of spinners and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to be fairly uh, general and uh, imprecise in my discussion of supersymmetry in Lecture 2. Lecture 3, uh, since the first part of the course is, is about conformal symmetry, I'm not only going to describe in Lecture 3 how conformal symmetry is a loophole uh, to coleman mandula I also want to tell you some of the details of what this symmetry group is. So this Lecture 3 is also going to uh, begin to develop uh, the details of the conformal symmetry group. So that's my plan for the week. So let's get started with Poincaré. So Poincaré, what is it? It's a Lie group, a continuous uh, symmetry group, that's generated uh, by some elements that you should be familiar with uh, at this point. It's generated by uh, space-time translations, and it's also generated by the Lorentz group, the elements of the Lorentz group, uh, which you probably remember consist of uh, spatial rotations and also Lorentz boosts. So those are the three sets of elements. Uh, and they're also the symmetries of, of special relativity and of relativistic quantum field theory. So they're, they're very important for our, our, our understanding of the way the world works. Okay, so that's Poincaré. And, you know, given a Lie group, uh, you can always consider very tiny elements of the group or infinitesimal elements of the group. These are the, the, the Lie algebra elements that generate the action of the group. So I want to think about some spatial coordinate, x mu, mu is this index that runs over time and, and spatial coordinates. And uh, under an infinitesimal element of Lorentz, this is going to go to a slightly shifted value of x mu, shifted by a very small translation and a very small uh, rotation and boost given by this, this uh, omega tensor with two indices. Okay, and so if I have this infinitesimal element, I can also consider the amount that uh, my spatial coordinate changes the difference between the new and the old value of x, and that's of course given by uh, this infinitesimal translation and this uh, boost uh, uh, rotation, okay? So there's a more abstract way of characterizing Poincaré. What Poincaré really is, it's the set of elements which leave uh, the following distance invariant. It's called delta s squared is eta mu nu delta x mu delta x nu, okay? That's what Poincaré really is. Um, where I'm, I'm, this eta mu nu, this is the Minkowski tensor in mostly plus signature. We'll work in mostly plus signature in this, in this class. And, uh, and so I, I, I want this object to be invariant. So, so what does that mean uh, in terms of the action of the group? Let, let's go on to the next page since I'm, I'm running out of space here. Okay, so if, if this is going to be an invariant, then delta s squared, let's see, under the action of the group, I'm going to get two new uh, delta x's. I'll get a delta, the old delta x mu plus the shift, which is just the action of Lorentz, since the, 
the, the translation is going to cancel out of that, that difference, that delta x. So these two delta x's, I have this delta x mu, and then I also have the delta x nu, again shifted by uh, the Lorentz, the infinitesimal Lorentz element. So let's expand that out. So I expand that out. I've got the old distance, delta x mu, delta x nu, contracted with uh, this Minkowski tensor. And then to linear order, I've got two new terms. I've got eta mu nu, omega mu lambda, delta x lambda, delta x nu. And then I also have eta mu nu, delta x mu, omega nu rho, delta x rho. And then plus terms I'm, I'm, I'm not going to care about because they're going to be very small. I'm just working infinitesimally. I'm just working to linear order here. Then we can simplify this, this out. So the first term is our old distance, delta s squared or the square of our old distance. And then the second term, second, uh, second and third terms combine to give me omega mu nu plus omega nu mu, delta x mu, delta x nu, plus higher order terms that I, I will ignore. But I, I need this to vanish order by order in this expansion. And so in particular, uh, if I want this distance, this uh, Lorentz invariant distance to, 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 to not be affected by the Lorentz group, I'm forced to impose the condition that this omega tensor be anti-symmetric that omega mu nu plus omega nu mu is equal to zero, okay? And that's the condition on the Lie algebra elements that generate Lorentz. Okay, so let's keep going in this discussion of Poincaré. Let's think a little bit about how at the Lie algebra level these uh, elements of Poincaré compose. So if I compose infinitesimal elements, well, if they were group elements, I can just combine them, right? Multiply one after the other. But if I'm gonna compose the Lie algebra elements, uh, we know from, from our, our study of Lie algebras and so forth that they compose through a, through a commutation relation. So the way these compose, I wanna talk think about a delta one composed with a delta two. That means I take the commutator of these two deltas acting on x mu, uh, which is defined here as delta one, delta two, acting on x mu minus delta two, delta one, acting on x mu, okay? Uh, so, so to see how that, that works in detail, maybe this arrow notation is the most useful to see how this, this double difference this double difference works. So if we act uh, with delta two, or, or say delta one uh, first, we act with delta one first, this goes to x mu plus a one mu plus omega one mu nu x nu. And then we can act again now with a two. And so this will go to a x mu plus a one mu. That doesn't change. Plus omega one mu nu x nu, that remains the same. But now I've got a bunch of extra terms here. I've got a shift by my translation, a two mu. And I've also got a boost uh, or, or, or rotate um, uh, that, that, that little shift that we had before. So there's another term here, which is gonna look like omega two mu nu x nu plus a one nu plus omega one nu lambda x lambda. Okay, so that's the, the double action of these two deltas. Uh, which means in principle, which means um, that if I compose the two, now I can write delta two delta one as, as the difference between uh, the new value and the old value, delta two delta one, what is this? Uh, this is omega two mu nu, a one nu, plus omega two mu lambda, omega one lambda nu, x nu. So those are the terms that are gonna matter and then there's some other terms that are gonna drop out of the difference. So there's gonna be some other terms here that, I'll, that I won't bother to write down, but they're gonna be the same no matter if I act delta two delta one x mu or delta one delta two x mu, okay? So that, that's the important point. So, so at the end of the day, what I get from the commutator is I get delta two commutator delta one acting on x mu. Uh, this is going to be the first guy, omega one mu lambda, a two lambda minus omega two mu lambda, a one lambda, uh, plus the second guy, uh, which is, is purely Lorentz in nature. So omega one mu lambda, omega two lambda nu minus omega two mu lambda, omega one lambda nu, all acting on x nu. Okay, so that's, that's an important result. So that tells us how two elements of, of Poincaré uh, compose. And I'm gonna have occasion to refer to this equation quite a lot of times. And so let's give it a label. Let's call it the happy face equation in honor of one of my favorite professors from my college days who used to label 
equations in a similar fashion. Okay, so let's copy this and study it and look at it on the next page. So from this, we can read off the new elements or, or the new the new elements under 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 composition, right? So we, we, we've generated a new we've generated a new infinitesimal element. It has a new there's a new translation here, uh, which is the composition of a Lorentz boost with the old translation. And there's a new Lorentz generator as well. Omega mu nu, uh, which is a combination of these two uh, original Lorentz generators, omega one mu lambda, omega two lambda nu, minus omega two mu lambda, omega one lambda nu. And I'll just point out here, if you look at this 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 uh, this combination, omega mu nu is still anti-symmetric. Remember, this was our condition that it be a generator of Poincaré, and that's preserved under this composition. So that's uh, a necessary uh, requirement uh, for, for, for this composition, and it's, it's indeed satisfied. So that's gratifying. Okay, so that's how Poincaré acts on space-time coordinates. And now, unfortunately, the story doesn't end here. It gets a little bit more abstract and complicated because we, we need the action of Poincaré not just on space-time, but we need to think about how it acts more generally in a more abstract way. Since we're doing quantum field theory, uh, we need to know, for example, how it, how it acts on quantum fields. So that, that's where we're going with this. So I, let's, let's, let's become a little bit more abstract here, more abstract presentation. So instead of just writing it in terms of these uh, a's and omegas, let's write the action on space-time in terms of some operators. So here's our small translation, omega nu p nu of x. And now um, instead of just writing it directly in terms of some kind of index contraction, we've, we've put a, an operator in the middle, a little Hermitian generator. This is going to be the momentum generator. And similarly for Lorentz, we'll put a little generator of uh, space-time translations and boosts in the way of that index contraction. And so there's some things going on here which uh, should pay attention to. The, the, the use of I here uh, makes uh, P and M Hermitian. So the generators of our Lie algebra will be Hermitian operators. And there's also a 2, so this is the i, and then the 2 here, um, this is so we don't double count. So omega 1, 2, which is equal to minus omega 2, 1, uh, counts once and not twice in that, in that uh, Einstein summation convention. Okay, so in this new language, we can write this uh, composition law in a more abstract form in terms of a commutator algebra. So the, the commutator of two momenta, this just vanishes. The commutator of a momentum and a Lorentz generator uh, is related to momentum. And then the most complicated one here, the, the commutator of two uh, Lorentz generators is again a Lorentz generator. Plus one last element here. So there's four of these in this sum. Uh, basically, the, the structure is more or less forced by the, the anti-symmetry of the, of the indices. Um, if you have one such term, then the, the remaining three are forced by, by anti-symmetry. Uh, so, so there's this sort of structure of a, of a semi-direct product. The Lorentz itself is, of course, a group all on its own. The momenta uh, generate some kind of abelian group. Uh, but then when you put them together, the momentum and the Lorentz get twisted together so that the commutator of momentum with Lorentz again gives you uh, 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 momentum. And you can verify this um, from, from the happy face equation that, that, that I wrote down previously. And indeed, that's, that's an exercise uh, that I, 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 leave, I leave you to do. So there's an exercise to verify this follows from, uh, from our explicit uh, description of how, how you compose elements. Okay, very good. So we now have this more abstract language we can use, and I want to use that to think about quantum fields. I want to ask, how does Poincaré act on quantum fields? So here's my quantum field. Uh, it depends indirectly on the Poincaré group or, or responds indirectly to the Poincaré group through its dependence on space-time. A, a quantum field is some function uh, at every point in space-time. But that field may also have uh, indices of its own. It may transform in some non-trivial representation of, of Lorentz. And so there's also a direct response uh, uh, to the action of Poincaré on the group uh, through, through, this index, through this index i. So this labels some sort of group representation under Poincaré. So to say that a little bit more formally or a little bit more precisely, the change in the field uh, in response to 
to Poincaré, there's going to be a direct part of it, which depends on how that field uh, transforms directly under Lorentz, represented by that index capital I. And then there's also going to be an indirect part, uh, which depends on how, how Poincaré acts on the space-time point of which this, this uh, quantum field is a function. So this is the, the direct response, and this is the sort of indirect response uh, because of this dependence on, 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 on x mu. Okay, so let's talk about the indirect response first, because maybe that's a little bit uh, uh, more straightforward to, to, to begin with. We, we can you know, work this out very straightforwardly from, from a Taylor series, just expanding the quantum field near the point x mu in the Taylor series. So we can write phi i of x mu plus delta x mu as what? As, uh, well, actually, let's not do it quite that way. Let's consider the difference. So we don't need the leading term in the Taylor series. We'll just look at the leading order uh, piece that survives the difference. So phi i minus x mu. So the leading thing that survives that difference is uh, you know, the change in, in x, the delta x mu uh, times a derivative of the field phi i of x mu. And then, of course, we can expand delta x mu. We know what that is for Poincaré. It's a translation uh, plus a boost or rotation. Oh, and I see I'm doubling indices here, which is which is bad. So let me let me fix that on the on the line above. Let's just give that a different index. So we don't get confused about what we're contracting. Okay, so that's that's the indirect response of the field. And now the direct response. I have a claim here, and the claim is that uh, this i or capital J index is only uh, a Lorentz representation. That the action of p mu of momentum of translations is is only is only through the dependence on space-time. So I can represent that purely as, as a derivative. I mean, it's an interesting question whether there might be quantum fields that, that have some index uh, that, that responds to translations, but it, it's, you know, it's, in most of our experience, it, it doesn't come up. I don't know of any examples where, where, where this might be an issue. Um, for, for tensor fields, right, if you just have some, some complicated field which has a bunch of tangent and cotangent indices, Translation, it leaves the uh, tangent and cotangent planes untouched in flat space. And so we expect the dependence of um, the dependence of a, 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 the sort of direct response of the field to translation to be, to be trivial. It, these i's and j indices don't, don't tra transform under, under, under momentum. And then I, I, you know, I can just maybe remind you, it's probably useful to, to have a reminder about how exactly you can you know, go from this derivative operator to a translation. Um, so if I have a function, now forget about the index now, since that index is trivial anyway under translation. Under a Taylor series, I can just write this as f of x plus a mu d mu f at x plus higher order terms, which I can then also write uh, using our definition of momentum as minus i uh, uh, partial mu. I can write this as plus i a mu p mu acting on f of x plus higher order terms. Or I could even go ahead and resum those terms and write this as an exponential i a mu p mu acting on f of x. So this is just a set of uh, relations that's useful to keep in mind when, when, when one is thinking about translations. So let's keep going. Let's keep going. Uh, I could maybe also remind you about how, how Lorentz acts on, on space-time or, or space-time functions. So if I have f of some finite element of Lorentz, some finite rotation or boost, I can think of this in a Taylor series expansion. If that finite am amount is, is very close to the identity, well, the leading part is just the function again, but then there, there'll be a plus i mu, sorry, plus i over two, uh, nu lambda, m nu lambda, f acting on f of x at rho, say, plus higher order terms. And then I can even write that explicitly in terms of derivatives, just how we did in the case of momentum. You can write this as f of x nu uh, minus uh, one half omega nu lambda, x nu d lambda minus x lambda d nu acting on f of x in row plus higher order terms. And so this actually gives you yet one more way to think about those commutation relations. So I said you, you, you could have worked them out uh, from, from the commutator of this delta 1, delta 2 that we had at the beginning of the lecture, but you can also work them out uh, using how uh, this, this, this function space representation of, of, of the Poincaré group using that, that momentum is minus i uh, partial derivative, and that m mu nu is i over 2 x mu d nu minus x nu uh, d mu. Actually, that, that factor of 2 is not there. 
that's the factor of two that we we added by hand right so it's just this okay so so using this you ought to be able to also work out the commutation relations but again this is not the whole story this is just how Poincaré acts on the the dependence of the function through its dependence on 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 space-time, um, we also need to know how Poincaré acts on these indices. What was this matrix Gij that I wrote down before? And it depends a lot on the context. I mean, you have to look at specific examples to get a better idea. You know, in the standard model, there's a photon, for example, which has a, 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 a vector index, a mu of x. And so in this case, i would be mu, it would be some vector representation of Poincaré, or you could think about an electron, in which case you could write a spinner field. We'll have a lot more to say about spinners later in the course. Now i equals alpha, this is a spinner representation of Poincaré. And uh, I've left this as an exercise to see what this uh, operator mu nu uh, looks like in these uh, two specific representation, the spinner rep and the vector rep. So that, that's an that's a exercise um, that I've left. Okay, so that's uh, all for a review of uh, the Poincaré group. Uh, now I'd like to move on and discuss a little bit about uh, internal symmetries. So one of the most important examples of internal symmetries are, are gauge symmetries. Uh, but there are others as well. So uh, th these these depend on some sort of gauged Lie group. And so given this gauged Lie group, this continuous uh, internal symmetry um, that has this local uh, transformation rule, there's an associated underlying Lie algebra, and let's call the generators T, T, T sub A. So again, uh, just like for Poincaré, you can compose the Lie algebra elements using a commutator. So if you take a commutator of two of these elements, T A and T B, uh, they're given by yet some other elements uh, summed over some so-called structure constants F, A, B, C. And we'll work uh, in conventions where the generators are Hermitian. Uh, you may find uh, from time to time people like to work with anti-Hermitian generators for Lie algebras. You just have to pay attention uh, to what, what the conventions are. And these F, A, B, C are, are, are the so-called structure constants. We'll just give an example. If we think about, say, the quarks in the standard model, we can think about a, a, a quantum field which has a spinner index alpha, but now the quarks in the standard model also transform uh, in the fundamental of a gauge group, the fundamental of a SU3 Lie group. And so they have this extra index as well, indicating this internal symmetry group. Okay, so we have these internal symmetries sometimes. And now, given all these symmetries, uh, we're guaranteed some conserved charges. You, you may recall Noether's theorem, one of the most important results in quantum field theory, that the generators uh, for each uh, continuous symmetry give a conserved charge, or they are a conserved charge. Maybe the most important uh, example of this is the energy, which we can think about as the time component of the four momentum. That's just the, the Hamiltonian or the, or the energy of the system. This generates time translations. So if you have a, a symmetry under, under time translations, you should have a conserved energy. Okay, so, you know, Given some physical system or some problem in physics, the first step is often to identify all the conserved charges. And then if we, we, we restrict, say, to quantum mechanics, uh, what does that mean? We should look at everything that commutes with T, everything that commutes with, uh, with, with uh, Hamiltonian, with PT. Because we know if it commutes, then those operators are mutually uh, diagonalizable. Uh, you can reduce things to eigenstates uh, that are you know, simultaneously eigenstates of all of these conserved charges. And that's often a very good way to start to solve a quantum mechanics problem. So in our case, what do we have? In our case, with Poincaré symmetry, we have rotations which uh, have a conserved charges which are called angular momenta. So if you know, the, the system is uh, symmetric under rotations, then, then angular momentum should be conserved. And these are what? In, in, in you know, four space-time dimensions or three spatial dimensions, those rotations are mxy, myz, and mxz, the rotations in these planes, in the xy plane, and the yz plane, and the xz plane. But not the boosts, mxt, myt, and mzt, uh, because they don't commute with the energy. So the purely spatial rotations do, so those are a nice set of conserved charges, but the boosts don't, so we, we, we drop those. And then we also often want uh, charges to mutually commute, in which case we probably don't want to keep these three uh, angular momenta. In, in quantum mechanics, we might just say want to keep Jz, which is also known as mxy rotations in the xy plane. And we might want to keep the Casimir, which is the sum of the squares of these guys. And that's, a, that's a, the maximal set of, uh, of charges that we can keep that correspond to angular momentum. Okay, so that's, that's it for Poincaré. That would be the set of conserved charges. Uh, some, 
a, a couple uh, corresponding to angular momentum. Uh, we'll also have uh, the conserved charge corresponding to energy and also the, the spatial translations. So we'll have conserved momenta as well, the spatial momenta. But now if we have internal symmetries as well, another important example um, are the TA. And Noether's theorem tells us if we have these internal symmetries, Noether's theorem tells us that uh, they will commute with uh, the Hamiltonian, that they generate uh, conserved charges as well. Okay, so why have I gone through all of this? It seems like we're getting a little bit away from Coleman mandula and, and supersymmetry and conformal symmetry and all that. Uh, there's, a, there's a method to my madness. Uh, the point is that um, I, I can now state what, what Coleman mandula is in, in a little bit more sensible framework, having reviewed uh, what the situation is. So Coleman mandula is, uh, is a much stronger statement uh, than Noether's theorem, at least in this context. Coleman mandula states that these internal symmetries commute not just with the energy, but with all of the momenta and also all of uh, the Lorentz generators, okay? And therefore, that these TA are in a trivial representation of Poincaré, that they extend the Poincaré group in a, in a completely trivial way. So to end this lecture, let's give a statement of the theorem. In any space-time dimension, d greater than or equal to 2, the only interacting quantum field theories have Lie algebra symmetries, which are a direct product of Poincaré with internal symmetries. So you can have Poincaré and you can have internal symmetries, but the way they interact with each other uh, is trivial. They basically don't interact. There's no commutation, non-trivial commutation elements between the internal and the Poincaré elements. Okay, so that's the statement. And now we're going to show you in the next couple lectures how this isn't quite true. Well, it is true as, as, as far as the assumptions uh, of the theorem go, but we'll show you how supersymmetry and conformal symmetry provide loopholes, interesting loopholes uh, for this theorem. Okay, so join me next time uh, for some more exciting stuff. Mm -hmm.